we need to think about the problem in all of its breadth. We need the existing economically viable pieces. And then how can governments help to grease the skids for some of those maybe more, more challenging technologies? Hi, I'm Dean Somerville, and welcome back to Energy in Conversation, the podcast that takes a look into our energy future through the eyes of people leading the way. This season, we're featuring young energy professionals on the podcast as part of our Generation 2050 initiative. They'll be the industry's leaders in 2050 when the world will look very different from today. The world's commitment to hold global temperature rise to well below 2 degrees C is going to involve big changes to large-scale infrastructure. But how are we going to pay for it? Global investment in the low-carbon energy transition hit $500 billion in 2020, but we need to go much further and faster to reach our targets. On this episode, Lawrence Slade, who leads the Global Infrastructure Investor Association, talks with two young energy professionals who understand all the ins and outs of financing forward-looking energy projects. A few notes before we jump into the conversation. You'll hear our guests talk about ESG, or Environmental, Social, and Corporate Governance. These are terms for measuring the environmental and social impacts of a company, as well as how it's managed. Specific to this conversation, many companies are taking a stance on issues like climate change or social justice and changing how they operate. This has been motivated by employees, customers, and investors, and is an important driver of investment in the low carbon transition. They also discuss the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. These 17 goals for 2030 range from ending poverty and hunger to taking urgent action to combat climate change, and all these goals are interconnected. And a final note for those of you not familiar with CCS or CCUS, that's carbon capture and storage, or carbon capture use and storage. Basically, it involves collecting carbon dioxide from a source and either using it for another purpose or storing it for as long as possible away from the atmosphere, lessening its effect on the climate. If you're interested in the topic, please check out episode two from this season of our podcast for more. Without further ado, enjoy the conversation on financing the low carbon transition. So welcome everyone to the Energy in Conversation podcast. We're going to focus today on financing the low carbon transition. And I think what we're really picking up on is just how much money is going to be needed to be spent to deliver our net zero ambitions by 2050. The key question, I think, is how industry, governments and investors can use green finance to enable that low carbon transition. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Lawrence Slade. I'm the chief executive of the Global Infrastructure Investor Association. And I'm really delighted to be joined this afternoon by two experts on the topic. So to kick things off, I'm going to ask Anne and Falco to just quickly introduce themselves. So perhaps I can go to you first, Anne. Yep. So my name is Anne Munaretto, and I'm a senior manager in EY's Climate Change and Sustainability Services Practice. And so what that means is that every day I support clients on topics like how do I navigate all these different environmental, social, and governance issues, which are most important to, to my business, my stakeholders, what do we do about them? And I've been focusing specifically on climate risk for the last several years. I'm a certified public accountant based in Chicago. Great stuff. Thanks very much, Anne. Over to you, Falco. Yeah, hello. My name is Falco van Wisse. I'm working with uh, Neptune as a head of uh, asset management and business development in the Netherlands. Neptune is basically one of the leading independent EMP companies in the North Sea, also in the northern parts of uh, Africa and Asia Pacific. And in my role, it's basically uh, consisting of two focus areas. One is strategy and optimization of strategic decision making for our existing portfolio of assets. And on the other hand, I'm also focusing on business development of exploration and production and also uh, new energy activities. And in the Netherlands, we primarily focus on CO2 storage and hydrogen. You both come from a finance business background, obviously with a, an energy focus. How do you find that sustainability and environmental concerns are, are making an impact? And has that changed in the last year or during the course of, of your career? When I was studying in school, I was studying accounting, but also environmental studies. And at the time, people said, well, that's a really odd combination. This was now, you know, 10 or 12 years ago. The difference is that people now say, well, naturally, of course, we're going to need accounting in environmental studies, in energy. We're going to need all sorts of disciplines to help tackle this. It's de facto that now ESG climate risk are just part of how, how companies, how industry, how governments have to think about solving these problems together. 
Turning to you, Falco, you mentioned strategic decision making, looking at the business development aspects in your role. How do you see the changing risks and rewards for investors when you're looking at your business growth plans? My career isn't that long, so it's a bit less than uh, than a decade. But but in that time, sustainability really became a whole topic within the, the field of finance. For most businesses, this is quite new. So it, it's, uh, it's a complex environment when thinking about new business models. For example, uh, where we're working around carbon capture and storage and hydrogen, it's important to understand the risk and, of course, the reward that is coming from those projects. I think it's key basically to differentiate the operational risk that we would have in any any course of business. We have to understand the maturity of that technology so that could be different when you're comparing hydrogen projects to offshore wind, for example, which is already there for a while now and that really starts to, uh, to mature. The risk profile basically changes over time. What do you sense that CEOs and CFOs should be doing in their roles as leaders? As you say, ESG has become much, much more important. We also have the UN SDGs, of course. If I'm a CEO and, and you're advising me, what's the sort of the package of advice you're giving at the moment? On this side of the pond, we're trying to catch up to you guys a little bit. Even in the US, just a year and a half ago, one in four assets under professional management were in some sort of investing scheme related to ESG. And now it's up to one in three assets under professional management. And so more and more, we're starting to see all sorts of investors and increasingly governments looking at companies to understand their climate related risks and opportunities. What are the physical risks associated with climate change? So when we think about those, we think about sea level rise increasing increment of, of storms, hurricanes, et cetera. And then also what are those transition risks associated with climate change? As we transition to a lower carbon economy, which parts of our business are likely to go down? Which parts of our business are likely to co up? How can we go ahead and position ourselves to be more resilient and also kind of seize those opportunities? Along with that, what are you as an organization doing is becoming increasingly important. Certain companies, their own greenhouse gas emissions might not be the most important piece. It's still important to kind of measure your greenhouse gas emissions and then chart a path towards decarbonization, ideally tied to you know science-based targets or you know, the Paris Accords or something like that. You know, how, how are you going to be resilient in the future and how can you go ahead and, and communicate that to your your, your shareholders. Falco, in, in your role as economics and business developer at Neptune, how do you feel that aspect coming in in terms of an operator and, and looking at hard decisions? You mentioned, uh, I think, CCS earlier. So I'm really excited to to be part of that. I think if I look at the activities that we currently undertake with, with Neptune and in, in my current role, and that's mainly, in my case, focusing on CO2 storage and hydrogen, it's very much about thinking about new business models. And we're learning a lot. We also see that with, with other parties that, that we talk with. Everyone tried to basically find, uh, find the right balance there and come up with cost-effective uh, solutions, basically, and, and try, try to make it work. What types of projects and, and technologies are being financed in order to reach net zero? And I wonder if you've got any examples of how financing has sped up the deployment or development of low carbon technologies. We're starting to see, you know, really significant cash flow into some of those low carbon technologies that are already what we can kind of call economically viable. A lot of the automakers now are, are fully in on electric vehicle. A lot of utilities are fully in on, on renewable energy. We're seeing investors kind of flock to those kinds of technology. And then there's kind of what I would call the not very sexy stuff, but still important stuff. Think of like energy efficiency. This is going to be a huge piece to helping us achieve that hopefully 1.5 degree C world because they're already economically viable. These make good sense for business, there's there's a big market there. Placing an internal price on carbon or existing carbon pricing schemes is going to help them drive what I would say is the right behavior or kind of that preference for, for low carbon technologies. Some other favorites that are continuing to be pretty hot are green bonds. I think two of my clients came to me to talk about, we're going to want to do a green bond. Here's what we want to put in it. This is basically where you are going to go ahead and raise capital and spend it on something within a criteria that you define, but something kind of related to maybe energy efficiency products or wind farms or something like that. And then VPPA, so virtual power purchase agreements. So this is the way that, that EY, for example, we were able to kind of source 100% re renewable energy. We built a couple huge wind farms in Texas. And that's nice because it allows corporations to, um, you know, be able to say, we, we provide additionality. You know, here's these two wind farms that wouldn't exist necessarily without us um, and then and then also kind of take take credit for all that good renewable energy but yeah it is kind of you know how do we get some technologies to that point of almost Moore's law how are we able to every year improve so that they go from this kind of makes sense to no this is a, a slam dunk 
Falco, if I can bring you back into the conversation, I know Neptune are involved with CCS and, and hydrogen and the rather cleverly named Poseidon project. I think I've, I've just about got that right. How are Neptune approaching this in terms of risk? Obviously, some of these early stage projects are not profitable yet. So what's the overall approach from the company in terms of bringing some of these, uh, these projects forward? I think the Poseidon project is really sort of a pilot project in the field of hydrogen. So what we see as a future business is hydrogen potentially on a bigger scale and connecting that potentially to uh, to offshore wind farms. And with Poseidon as a pilot project, I think that raised quite some uh, some attention in the last couple of months. Uh, even worldwide. So it's, it's really a unique project that we're trying to employ here. I think what, what makes it a good environment basically for this project is a platform on which we, we are running this project. So that's a Q13A platform in the Netherlands, and it's quite close to shore. It's already electrified via power cable. And what we try to do is basically to capture the learnings of this pilot to further understand how electrolysis can work offshore and how we can use those learnings for follow-up projects further offshore. So what you see in the Netherlands is that they are making plans for for wind farms uh, further offshore, and we think that you know that there there's sort of limited space in the area. And as as wind farms are being developed further and further offshore, there becomes a um, certain uh, threshold distance where it could be more interesting to actually transform the electricity into hydrogen and transport the molecules to shore. So coming back to Poseidon, so this is really now an important pilot project for us. So we are teaming up with with different parties, and this project will be uh, primarily equity financed by the consortium partners. So that's basically how we try to mature this. And hopefully in the future, we can establish larger scale hydrogen projects by using existing infrastructure that we have on the North Sea. And then we hope to attract also uh, different forms of funding. We're trying to capture the learnings here and um, and, and try to, to understand also the business model for the future. Investors looking, of course, at the risk return profile, but also at the cash flow profile, basically. And I think hydrogen could be an attractive investment opportunity for there's a big debate, isn't there, within the European Union and the UK around the use of hydrogen and the future of hydrogen. How is that playing out over in the States, Anne? Are you seeing similar levels of debate around that? Or as I think you touched on earlier, a little bit further behind? Yeah, so I think we're very interested in hydrogen. I think it'll take a little bit of time for us to figure out exactly where those applications are. Some other technologies are, are a little bit further along. Like when we think about electrification of transportation, to what extent is that going to be through just kind of batteries and that kind of thing versus a, a hydrogen model? I think that kind of remains to be seen. But then when we talk, you know, some of those like harder to abate sectors, you think about air travel, shipping. I, I do think that we're going to see hydrogen play a role. There is still ongoing debate. That's just one point of view. One for both of you, I think. And we've seen, Falco, the sort of great explanation you gave around CCS and its role in hydrogen and, and the projects that Neptune are working on. How do you sense that public and private sectors are working together? Something like CCS, where it's going to need a bit of government input, maybe support funding models through to, and you mentioned sort of how we decarbonize the aviation sector, etc. How do you sense the private and public sectors are working together here? Do you think that we've got suitable regulatory and, and policy frameworks in, in place or is, is there more, more to come? And obviously, this is going to be a major conversation in the run up to, to COP26 later this year and the, the finance summit that will be happening just before that. I think government really play a crucial role in this by means of allocating resources, but also indeed the establishment of a uh, regulatory and, and economic sound environment, and, and especially a stable environment on the long term to uh, facilitate investments, attract uh, private investors uh, in the future. But in the end, I think the, the private sector is key here to uh, find the fastest and most cost-effective solution for some of the issues that we face. I think if you look at carbon capture and storage, for example, I think we already had the EU ETS system implemented a couple of years ago. And you now also see sovereign states increasingly implementing carbon taxation on the national level. You, you saw that in Norway, the Netherlands follow, and I, also in the UK, they have a similar scheme. That really got things moving in the sense that, that industries start to uh, to recognize this issue and, and they're really facing increasing cost of, of emissions and they want to uh, contribute basically to a sustainable business environment. Governments 
should be really thinking about how transformation to market forces will will go. Well, you saw that, for example, with, with offshore wind that, that really got matured in the past. Uh, governments introduced a contract for different structures. And at some point that has to be taken over by the market. And then, then you can think about the power purchase agreements that I'm just uh, described. And I, I, th- I think that that's a critical balance that governments need, need to find and, and also bridge to the private sector. I'd like to build on that a little bit with you, Anne, perhaps, and and the sort of the stick and carrot approach. Some government policies, contracts for difference, access to cheap capital, PPAs, project auctions, etc., which are the carrots to get people involved. From your point of view, Falco mentioned in Europe and in the UK, we've got the emissions trading scheme and carbon pricing. What's your sort of overall sense on, on where we are? Yeah, are we on track? Yeah. Um, No, absolutely not. So sometimes I work with my clients on basically thinking through the different climate scenarios and how resilient is their business going to be in each of those. They're like, well, we don't need to pick the business as usual scenario because aren't we on that that path to the Paris Accords? And I'm like, I know, despite what the media, what you might hear in the media and all the net zero targets, we are on that business as usual approach. One of my favorite tools I use to kind of show what it's going to take from a policy perspective to help deliver on that two degree C or 1.5 degree C world is this tool called En-ROADS from MIT and Climate Interactive. So if people have their laptops up in front of them, feel free to go there and play around. Basically, in order to get where we need to be from a low carbon transition perspective, we're going to have to throw the book at it. There's going to have to be pretty significant carbon pricing. I know the IMF has a position of 75 US dollars per ton by 2030. That's going to be hard to achieve. If you take a look at some of the the IEA scenarios on what that sustainable development scenario looks like in developing economies and developed economies, both of them are significantly higher than we are today. I think what's nice about the price on carbon, too, is that most of the schemes are what we call revenue neutral. From a government perspective, that means we're not just taking this and using the money for something else. This is you know, something that we're going to give back through a dividend scheme because when someone emits carbon, it affects someone else. Governments right now are doing a lot of cleanup because of natural disasters, et cetera, caused by industry. We have to throw the book at it, right? So what are we doing around incentives to energy efficiency? How are we helping to activate the economy from an electrification perspective? What are we doing from incentives to help make it a little bit easier? Government's not going to be able to do it alone. And the private sector, you know, it's a little bit too much to ask. They are running businesses. So how can we all work together on this? So it's a real partnership approach is is needed effectively there. Do you think government frameworks and policy is sufficient to create something that, that is investable? Or is it something that needs to be done at, at an individual household or, or business level? I think that really depends on the technology. I, I think, for example, we mentioned earlier onshore wind. That's a good example where we really saw string the technology and, and the market supported by uh, effective government support. I think at, at the same time, you see with some new technologies, if you look, for example, at hydrogen, I think at the moment that, that's still quite difficult for, for private investors to really in, invest uh, large sums of capital. And I think there are two reasons for that. One is that basically the regulatory framework is not yet clear. And, and I'm talking then about uh, green hydrogen and blue hydrogen, uh, the combination with CCS. On the other side, the market is not established well enough. Of course, if you uh, want to build your, your supply side, there needs to be a certain demand. There are huge ambitions. Key point here is that we should be careful that policy building is not basically lagging behind with the developments that we see within uh, within the sector. Anne, over to you on that one. So your, your thoughts on, on energy efficiency, but then also I'm going to promote you into the government and you're looking at building back better coming out of the pandemic. What would you be concentrating on? You know, how would you get a sort of a similarly rapid response to the climate crisis as to COVID-19? Thank you so much for the promotion. Definitely very deserved. Um, If you can see me, I'm waving my arms quite wide. We need to think about the problem in all of its breadth. And so you mentioned energy efficiency. That is going to be one piece that needs to be tackled. We also need all of the pieces that that Falco is talking about. We need the existing economically viable pieces. And then how can governments help to grease the skids for some of those maybe more, more challenging technologies? And then when it comes to building back better, I think it's try to invest where we can out of all those options at the intersection of jobs and social justice. If I'm getting that last bit, it's it's making sure that where we're using government funding, it's being directed at those who need it most, as opposed to those who are able to pay, but that you're also creating the the stable frameworks and policies that will ease in private finance to to combine with government dollars to, to create more opportunities and deliver more faster. 
You know, I think those are valid points. I think with COVID-19, what you saw is really impacted global energy investments. So that, that really went down substantially last year and particularly also for uh, the oil and gas investments, which fell uh, sharply. At the same time, you saw, you saw that clean energy investments went up a bit, but still remains far behind what we need in, in order to basically reach our target. As part of that, you see that also the spending on energy networks and infrastructure lags, uh, lags behind. I think that's actually a crucial point eh? because I think infrastructure structure and grids really form uh, the backbone of scalable energy systems. And as such, I think it's key to ramp up investment levels there to secure these future power systems. And, and getting back to, to capital efficiency, I think it's also very much about creative solutions. One key point in relation to this infrastructure piece is that we should really make smart use of the existing infrastructure that's already there. And I think that can really boost capital efficiency. I think that's an important part. It's easy to get carried away by the idea that it's all about new infrastructure. Using our current infrastructure in the smartest possible way is really key in making sure that investment can, can flow into existing infrastructure. As we're, we're sort of moving to the end now, do you think the costs of the energy transition are being shared fairly or, or actually you know, can they be shared fairly? The part that really keeps me up at night is jobs. So on a personal note, my husband is a union pipe fitter, whether it's a nuclear energy plant, a facility making food products and oil refinery, they're the ones that are kind of taking the engineering design plans and cutting pipes and welding and that kind of thing. And he and his cohorts of union brothers and sisters are not the only ones that are currently delivering on that infrastructure every day to make sure that we've got, you know, internal combustion engines and, and brown power. We need to make sure that when we talk about this energy transition, a huge piece is this jobs piece. And I run into it with my automotive clients. I run into it with my energy clients. Part of it from a corporate perspective is how are you attracting the right talent? But also how do you go ahead and find the employees that want to make that transition too? And how are you providing them with the training? And, and obviously there's that government element too. How do we support that retraining? And to some extent, it has to involve high pay. If you think of like a coal miner, for example, they've got a really nice paycheck in part because they're compensated for very dangerous work. They don't necessarily want to take a 50% pay cut. They might sit it out for a while, wait for that job to come back. So when we think about this energy transition, we're going to have to really double down on jobs. There's other aspects too, right? Small island nations, there's you know folks in kind of that lower, lower socioeconomic perspective that are hit by the physical impacts of climate change and how are we kind of supporting them through there. Lots of discuss in this area, a huge issue, really that intersection of kind of environmental and, and social. So one quick question to both of you as young professionals in the sector, what would you say the skills and qualities that people looking to join the sector would need to be able to work in, in this area and how can organisations facilitate that? So I think this energy transition is a whole new world for many of us and I think young professionals can really give us new energy basically to organisations. I think it's not only about uh, young professionals, basically every professional can uh, can have a huge impact with having the right mindset at least. And I think being entrepreneurial is very important, innovative, out of the box thinking. That's what can bring us further. And indeed, we want to reach this target as uh, efficient and as fast as possible. It's very important that organizations embrace this change and uh, maybe also reshape a bit the way of working and maybe focus a bit more on project based work. Also, really focus on sharing knowledge and, and, and working together across different departments within organization. On the other hand, I think opportunities are sometimes uh, plenty and it's important that organizations also uh, really keep the focus and see what really best fits basically within, uh, within the strategy of companies. It's either really um, embracing change and looking at uh, the opportunities in out of the box. On the other hand, focus and, um, and strategy minded, basically. Great answer. Anne, over to you. I'm going to cover this kind of from three different ways. The first is, yes, you can kind of get a job like Falco or, or like me, where you're doing this 100% of your time every day. So, you know, I work with asset managers that are analyzing corporate reporting from a climate risk perspective. You can work in corporations that are considering climate risks and opportunities, working on decarbonization pathways. You can do consulting like me. You can also work in finance, supporting that low carbon transition, helping to make sure that financing is going to the right kinds of projects. So, so all those are kind of like what I'd call like 100% jobs, but then Falco, you already touched on it. We need to switch from this is what other people do to this is what everybody does. I was talking with my colleague and, and he was a teacher. He said, I tell my students, take a look at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 of them. Figure out which ones you're passionate about. Maybe it's climate change. Maybe it's alleviating poverty. Find a way to incorporate that into your job in some way. 
The third piece is you can use your voice. Look at your investments. How are you tying those to an ESG specific fund, a low carbon fund? Use your voice as an employee. Go tell your bosses and your bosses' bosses and your, you know, your CEO that this matters to you. I think that kind of with all three of those together, hopefully we'll be a little bit on the right path. Really nice point there in terms of using your voice. I think that's really important. And if I may, I'll just add one, and that's use your networks and grow your network and use bodies like the Energy Institute and local sections, etc., to do just that. And I, I think that's a really key part, actually. The Energy Institute has a huge part to play in terms of the skills and, and transitioning into other areas. But I think it's something that when we're looking at financing new projects, we also need to be looking about how we're bringing in new people into the sector and we're supporting new careers and helping people transition and what the role is for government and for the private sector. Falco, if I can come to you, the sort of question of the season, if you like, when you look back on your career and, and you mentioned at the start, you're sort of coming up to 10 years into your careers, what would you have liked to have seen happen in the energy system? And what would you like to be remembered for in terms of your contribution to that? Well, that's a question. <laughs> I think really this energy transition is one of the bigger challenges of our generation. I think in my role as a business developer, I really like um, and enjoying contributing to being a bridge between those parties and bringing those market parties together. I think some of the parties we're talking to now were maybe not parties which were a natural match before, basically, with previous businesses. And for me personally, it's, it's, it's really about creation of new things together. And, and I'm really excited to be part of that. Great stuff. Okay. Same question to you, Anne. So based on science, based on the Paris Accords, I want us to be well on that path to 1.5 degrees C worlds. Huge change. I like the way that you said that, Falco. This is kind of our generation's challenge. From an energy perspective, electricity, all renewable, electrification of, of our transportation system, massive advancements on those kind of harder to abate sectors. And then when I think about what I want to do as part of this, some of the fun things I get to do, you know, when I work with clients, once they trust me, I'm like, you should add that you support a price on carbon to your positions, right? So I get to kind of help them think, you know, here's what we should do around around a net, net zero target. So so I love kind of being able to do that. But like when I think about the energy transition, at this point, I feel like it's purely economics. I know it's going to happen. And so then the questions are, how quickly is it going to happen? Is it going to happen in in time to really avoid the irreversible impacts of climate change? And then will it happen prior to major geopolitical disruptions as well? I want my legacy to be focused on helping making this as quick as possible um, and helping to, to make it just too. So I want to help my clients navigate this in a just manner for their workers, for their customers, for their investors, and make it as quick as possible. I think that's great. And I think listening to the two of you talking about all the issues around financing the low carbon transition, I'm going to leave this podcast much more optimistic than I was at the start. So thank you very much, both of you. I think it's been a, a really engaging conversation. Thanks, Falco. Thanks, Anne. A big thank you to today's guests, Anne Munaretto, Falco Van Vissen, and Lawrence Slade. To find out more about our guests, or if you'd like to explore resources on financing the transition, visit our website, energy-inst.org slash podcast. You can also find out more about our Generation 2050 initiative. As always, we'd love to hear from you. Please get in touch by tweeting to at Energy Institute. And tune in next time when we'll discuss the future of flight in a low-carbon world. Energy in Conversation is brought to you by the Energy Institute. This episode was produced by Martin Begley and Daniel DeVeza. Music is by Jack Keeney. I'm your host, Dean Somerville. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.